can imagine this six foot three man feet sticking out the end of his bathtub as he's playing with a mobile. Device. I'd rather not, but this week on Backward Compatible, Nathaniel Torson returns to expand upon last week's discussion of interactive fiction and branching stories in games. Plus, some looks back to the Ghostbusters RPG and the original Final Fantasy. BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Backward Compatible. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 51 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined tonight by Jim. Hey. Hello, everybody. And joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And we have a returning guest this evening, Nathaniel Sorson. (laughs) This bodes well. Uh, But our media topic for tonight is going to be a bit of a continuation, in a way, of um, uh, last week's uh, chat that we had with Richard about interactive fiction. Um, can, can they interact with this topic? Are they able to interact? Yeah, they can post comments on our website. Yes, I believe there's the ability one, to do that. And if they're good, one of the crew members will respond to it. I, I think that's true. I think that's still like a standing, mm-hmm. a standing rumor. It is. It might still happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you this wish should... to continue this podcast, please go to page 10. <laughs> <laughs> if you wish to switch to another podcast, please... Do so now. You know, that's a good a good time to mention that... Of course, uh, doing that is the one where you die and you have to go back to the last right. That's right. The that's podcast. Exactly right. So. No, I was going to say it's a good, a good time to mention that we do actually have, I believe on the YouTube version, we do have some uh, little... Did, are you putting in the notations yes, for different, different segments? The so, timestamps, yeah. Yeah, so if someone does want to skip ahead to our meaty topic, uh, that is an option. You don't have to. We've got plenty of other segments, plenty of things to talk about today. But if y'all are really interested in the meaty topic and want to skip there, that is an option. Go down to the description and just click on the time code. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, starting off, uh, let's mosh. Get ready for the butt mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. All right. I want to start off this mosh because I didn't talk at all about what I've been playing last week. Uh, of course, let me guess. Let me guess. I'm gonna read your mind. <laughs> it has a gear in it. Yes. <laughs> a, Lots of them actually. A man named Snake. <laughs> Am I close? Is he a man or is he a representation of all of us? Or is um, he a legend? He is a legend. That's true. <laughs> no, I've, I have oh, been playing dear. more Metal Gear Solid Five, but <laughs> the reason uh, uh, the Phantom Pain. But the reason I wanted to mention it um, again on the podcast is that I did finish up Chapter One, which has its own closing credit sequence it feels uh, uh, very much like the end of the entire game and you go through the entire credits and at the very end there's another cutscene and you just sort of continue the game and there's more to it and you start chapter two um this is where i i felt that uh, it really shines through that uh some of the production was cut there's still more cutscenes. there's still more story to tell but um in terms of the actual um story the the i guess I should say main mission, because I would hesitate to call them new story missions. Mm. They're new main missions. It's more the fallout of the first chapter. Right. And so what you get with the main missions um, now is like you get to redo um, a lot of the, the older missions that you've done, but now there's new restrictions. So it's extra hard. You have to use certain weapons. You have to you know maybe go in with uh, under-equipped, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I just threw that they didn't know when to quit. It actually reminds me a bit of the end of Peace Walker, because the game ends... Mm-hmm. But then there's still some extra missions you can do on top of it. It's not necessarily super important to sort of the main plot, if you will, but there's still stuff you can do, and there's still a little bit of story development that, in theory, will lead you up to the events of whatever the next game is. I've still so, been getting quite a bit of story, actually. Yeah, there so are there are still like their, original missions. Yeah. It's just that they also mix it in with sort of filler content, if you will, in the form mm-hmm. of the replay missions. But enough about that for now. Nathaniel, uh, what have you been playing recently? I've been playing uh, a lot of the Wii U with my son. He's discovered Minecraft recently, which is something else entirely. But we played Mario Kart 8. Now, I've loved Mario Kart in every incarnation. I think it's one of the great games. I mean, it's it's got a lot of variety. It's It's got uh, a, a lot of ways that you can get rid of that runaway leader problem. Okay? There is no such thing as a runaway you, leader. You mean being good? Get, get rid of that being good problem? <laughs> That no, guy who's like just better than everyone else. Getting rid of that being that, that lucky pesky problem. person who's just too good at video games. It's called rubber banding. Anyways, Mario Kart 8 is brilliant. It's probably the best one they've had so far, except for one feature that is driving me uh, insane. 
Okay. Now, in the previous versions of Mario Kart, when you're playing two player, you know, they did the, the split screen horizontally. So it was one person on top, one person on bottom. Now, they do vertically, which is absolutely impossible to drive, especially with all these new twisty tracks they have, because the tracks go up and down and around and so on and so forth. You cannot see around a corner to save your life in this stupid thing. But you, you realize they do that on purpose, right? It's suppo- you're supposed to like freak out because you don't know what's coming. So when you go around those corners and you're not sure what's there, you're supposed to have that moment of, well, what am I supposed to do? And then if you don't know the track already, you're in trouble. That's not what happens. It's not, well, what should I do? It's turn the corner, bam, I just got hit by something. But not, not what it is. But not if you've memorized the track really well. No, that, that's not true because the tracks are not consistent. Okay. For the track itself may be consistent, the stuff laying all over the track is not consistent. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Same. Yeah, to an extent, but usually people will put things in the same places. Especially, they, they sort of know, like, like what you're talking about. Um, they, about banana peels and stuff. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Banana people, peels. People, people put things uh, up there because they stray know. Stray tortoise can, shells, that kind of thing, yeah, bouncing around, yeah. that kind of stuff. But they know that, like, okay, this is the part where people can't see what's ahead, so I'm going to put it Plus, here. So you just go around the edges as opposed to in the middle. Plus, picking up coins becomes more difficult. Oh, also, yeah. jump skidding becomes dang near impossible because in order to do a good jump skid, okay, to drift, mm-hmm. you have to be able to see where you're drifting to in order to do it accurately so you can know when you take the finger off the button and, and just gun it forward. And it's 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 damn near impossible. And the, the, the reasons I saw online was they said, well, because so many of the tracks go upside down and vertical and all that stuff, we wanted to make sure that people could see up and down. And I'm still like... But if you're traveling on the track up and down, you're still seeing the same thing. It doesn't look like you're upside down. You're still like facing straight forward yeah, the and world's not, upside down. the world's upside down, <laughs> but you're fine, right? So still you can't see the sides. And it just it makes me nuts because when and there's I'm playing, not a setting to switch to horizontal. No, and that was the big one. If they had a if they had an option where you could switch that, that'd be fine. Yeah. But they did not include an option because they didn't want people to play that way. Well, what you do is you plug in a couple extra controllers, and you just have a couple of computer or a couple of player characters just sit there, and that way you've got square screens. This yeah, like quadrants. Yeah, but then <laughs> you've got the same problem multiplied up and down as well, side to side. You know, and that's fine if you're playing with a bunch of people like in you know Smash Brothers, and it's all just chaos. But you know, when you're really racing against one person, that's one of the things I loved about the Wii version was, you know, racing another person like my brother or somebody like that, and just you know, you're really racing them because mm-hmm. once you get to a yeah. point where you're good enough, you just kick the bots butts every time. Yeah. Right. Except in Mario Kart 8, they are a lot more cunning and they are a lot more vicious uh, than in the previous ones. But for the most part, when you're when you're playing other people, you're playing against the person, not the bots. So doing that just re- makes it really difficult to, uh, to to play the game. And that's my one big gripe about it. And, 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 it, and it flaws and otherwise a, a gem of a game, really. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. Right now we're working on uh, editing Season 3 of Roll With It. Uh, We're doing something a little bit experimental this time as far as our presentation, whereas in the past we've had a very uh, radio play sort of presentation where we'll have um, sound effects and stuff like that added in. We're not nixing the sound effects, but we're going a little bit more with what it would sound like at an actual role-playing table where people are making sound effects with their mouth and all sorts of fun fun stuff like that. Um, So it's a little bit more organic in that regard, but we're still making sure that we're trimming down um, mechanical talk and stuff like that into a very nice, you know, fast-paced, streamlined experience. Um, we're actually running the game in the Lady Blackbird system um, by John Harper, uh, but we did a mod, our GM, uh, Kevin Paul, uh, sort of modded the system to be a World War II setting. Uh, and basically the, we're, we start off in Camp Lucky Strike, which is actually a historical camp in um, France during World War II. They love their cigarettes there. Yeah, they do. This would be the Aegon John Harper, right? The yes. Guy over there. Yep, same guy. That is a brilliant system. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen Lady well, Blackbird. There were, there were like three new modules that just came out not too long ago. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they've got Chapter 3 now. Yeah. Uh, so two new ones for Lady Blackbird. Right, right, mm-hmm. right. But I, I haven't actually looked at them that closely because I want mm-hmm. uh, I want someone to run them. Actually, I want, mm-hmm. I want Kevin to run them. Yeah. Um, but what we're going to be experimenting with doing also is having a little bit more scoring, not necessarily so much that we're going to follow every moment with the score, but we're going to add more music and try to 
um, see if that sort of enhances the experience. Oh, that's bit. really cool. So mm -hmm. you got like Nick in there producing some mm -hmm. tracks for us. Yep, it's in progress, and that's why it's taking so long because I've got to finish kind of editing the episodes halfway and then get the music figured out and get them plugged in. So it's taking a while to put it out, but season three will be coming up soon. It's going to be so worth it, though. Mm -hmm. The story is really good. I, I, think. I, I have been looking forward to this one for months mm -hmm. because, I mean, from, from the idea's pitch, the original pitch of it being a historical thing all the way through to you know actually getting it in the can. And then um, our little uh, prequel that we did afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this story is just... It, Mm -hmm. It's kind of a. See what um, I did there? Yeah, <laughs> it, it's a bit of a noir caper, if you will. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, is this a is this um, a five episode season? Five episode. Five yeah. episode. Mm -hmm. Cool. So we can look forward to that maybe in a month or so. Hopefully, sometime in that in that time frame. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Um, yeah, I, I was not involved in this one, but I'm definitely interested in hearing it and seeing uh, how it came out. Yeah. Because I hear you guys had a lot of fun. Yep, it was cool. <laughs> This is Roleplay for Roleplay, the mechanics of tabletop role-playing games. Nathaniel, I know that you're you're kind of uh, um, definitely, at least among us, one of the biggest, um, you know, old school role-playing fans. I know you want to talk a little bit about Ghostbusters. Yeah, I actually like to pull this game out uh, every Halloween. Uh, it makes a nice switch from Call of Cthulhu, which is so grim. And, and first off, what, what year was this game uh, released in? Uh, 1985. I believe it was right after the Ghostbusters movie came out. So uh, they did two versions of it. They did the original version, which is by far the better version, and then they did Ghostbusters International after Ghostbusters 2 came out. Um, but Ghostbusters 2, uh, Ghostbusters International was a more sort of uh, chunky version of Ghostbusters. It was kind of like, uh, well, the original Ghostbusters was just too fun and free form. We're going to throw a bunch of rules in here to make it a, a real role playing game. <laughs> sort of thing, which incidentally doomed it to being ignored so other people could play the original one. Everybody loves the original one. Well, everybody I know loves the original one. And that's because it's a kind of a new wave sort of game for the mid-80s. It really is. The, the mid-80s, for those of you who didn't live through it, uh, was a time when games became incredibly simulationist. Yep. Um, they would have games like Phoenix Command that would, you know, take every single bullet and everything into consideration. I'm not talking about just how many bullets you were carrying, but how those bullets affected the combat themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, it got ridiculously complex. We had games that were in their ascendancy, like Rollmaster, which we called Chartmaster, uh, which <laughs> had about a bajillion charts you had to look through. And the, and the drive was getting away from D&D, &D, which was considered not very realistic. It was too abstract right. at that point. D&D <laughs> &D was too abstract? D&D &D was too yeah, abstract. Wow. That's right. And it was going more towards the, uh, we want to make a game where combat's ultra-realistic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where interactions are ultra-realistic. So this was really different because the actual rules in the Ghostbusters uh, game, a frightfully, frightfully fun role-playing game, uh, are... Uh, oh, I see what they did there. Yeah. Boo. They're actually very minimal. I see what you did there. <laughs> You've got a character. He's got four traits. Each of those traits has one talent associated with it. You just pull out of your butt, right? So, you know, if you've got brains, you've got physics as a talent, right? And you get a plus three on top of your, you know, rating of one to five for that. And you roll that many dice, and you're trying to get a, a target number. And that's pretty much the rules. The only twist to it are brownie points and ghost dice. The ghost die, you have to roll every roll. At least one of those dice has to be a ghost die. And it has a, a little Ghostbuster symbol on one side. And uh, some of these glowed in the dark, actually. If you got some of the later printings, they had glow in the dark ghost dice. That's fine. But uh, yeah, I don't know who's role playing in the dark, but uh, you can read the other dice, just the ghost dice. Uh, maybe point, mood so. lit more so than <laughs> you know, like, the dark. <laughs> but the ghost by candlelight. I mean, that'd be I mean, cool. don't, aren't you aware of all those like uh, satanic rituals people would do in their caves? I was there in the '80s when that was a big thing. <laughs> that is a topic for another day. I will harp on that one. Uh, and, and believe it or not, funnily enough, I will harp on it from the other side because I think uh, I think both sides took that but, to, uh, to yeah. It, it came back in in the '90s actually with Pokemon. That was the next satanic uh, mm -hmm. ritual game. It Actually, Vampire evolution. the Masquerade probably mm -hmm. pushed it that teaches evolution. Too, so. mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, Anyways. They, at least they knew what they were doing. Vampire. Well, they were unabashed about what right. they Right, they, they embraced it. They embraced it. Anyway, so the Even ghost die is like... Uh, by the way. 
the the ghost come the ghost comes up and bad things happen to you. It's kind of a this is where I, I think you guys would like it because it's narrative in the fact that the ghost die creates a yes yes but no no but situation. Mm-hmm. If uh, you succeed and you get the ghost, you succeeded but something happened right. If you fail and you get the ghost die, you failed and you screwed up really badly, right? Mm-hmm. So, so it's uh, not you you fail, but something good possibly happens. No, it's actually something worse happens. Sort of you, failing forward. Failing forward. That's exactly. So it's right. got some similarity with the uh, the, the Star Wars system at yeah. the Edge of the Empire. Yeah, a little bit. actually, yeah. But this is even before the first edition of the original Star Wars World. Oh no, 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 yeah, of course. This came much, much, yeah. much before. The game's better than I am. And then they had brownie points, which was something that was not very common back there. James Bond was one of the first games to use drama points uh, in order to, uh, or hero points in James Bond. Yeah, skill points, cool points, Arthur points, whatever you want. Yeah, whatever you want to call them. They were called hero points to James Bond, but to to modify dice rolls and things like that. Ghostbusters had brownie points, Mm -hmm. uh, which allowed you to actually modify results and to save your bacon if something happened to you and that sort of thing. Were there also special brownie points? (laughs) <laughs> well, I was going to ask you For if those brownie Col- points Colorado had nuts. Or <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. For those who are playing Ghostbusters in, in, in Jamaica, yes. The, uh, <laughs> the third thing... Busting those really ghosts, man. <laughs> you couldn't die in Ghostbusters. Unless it was just like, you just totally screwed the pooch and, and just made a mess of things... Uh, when there were plenty of ways to get out of it, you did something so stupid, the Ghost Master just said, yeah, now you're dead. And then your ghost comes back and haunts the previous player. I was just going to ask that if your ghost comes back, if you die, because that would make a lot of sense in the universe. But for the most part, you cannot die in that game. Basically, if you run out of brownie points and you get you know hit by a ghost or slimed or whatever, you spend like two weeks in the hospital and then you're back, right? right. That makes sense. So uh, you can't actually die in that game. In in the sense, it's more like the real Ghostbusters cartoon than the actual. Yeah, movies. you know that's what it sounded mm-hmm. like to me. Yeah. Was the cartoon out during that time? Yes. Yeah, well, the game movie. would be more like that. It would be more yeah. cartoony than anything else. Because, like for instance, one of the examples in the book says, um, "Well, so somebody straps a bomb to your Ecto one." And it blows up, so what you're left with is the frame of a car and a bunch of Ghostbusters with their hair all stuck up and, you know, all sit all over their face. So uh, yeah. that's the kind of thing you got going there. And it's, and it's, and it's a fun little game. The, uh, it's highly narrative in nature because it's really about making the bad jokes <laughs> and about, you know. We, we don't make jokes here. Oh, whatever. Okay. We need to hit that one for a future uh, Unplugged. Yeah, cool. That's it is from cool. West End Games, who also made Paranoia. Right. Which mm-hmm. I also wanted to. Do yes, we've also been talking about that one for. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we can look at that. Lots of uh, yeah, Easter thanks. eggs and, and, and teasers in this episode. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Let's all go on a nostalgia trip to see what we can learn from games of the past. All right, so I'm I'm resurrecting an old segment, uh, which is about old games, so it's kind of fitting. Uh, I've got a n- nostalgia trip. For y'all, I went back and I've been uh, playing through. Um, so did the via, thing. Yes, there we go. That's kind of what it sounds like. <laughs> Wait, weren't you yes. listening? We just played the thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, the uh, the Final Fantasy, uh, the original Final Fantasy game, which is one that I played back on the NES when it first came out, it was my first uh, Japanese role playing game, and I've been uh, playing a little bit of it because I found it on one of my. Um, sort of retro game trips that I go on sometimes with some friends. Wait, which one are you talking about? The original Final Fantasy on the NES. Oh, w- one, which was not actually one in America? No, but... one was one in America. But I thought three was six. And so it was. If you do the math, then it must have been like th- uh, three would have been one. No, one was one. <laughs> that was one was game. one, and then two in America was actually four, and then three was six. Well, what was six? Six, uh... Was six twelve? Or nine? No, we skipped it. After three came out, let's see, after Final Fantasy III came out, we went straight to seven, which was actually what the Japanese game was called. So by the U.S. perspective, we never had a four, five, or six. But, uh, but yeah, so, so I played through the original Final Fantasy, which is very, um, which is actually very um, Western RPG inspired. It, it has a very D&D um, inspiration base to it. For example, with the magic, uh, instead of having MP like in later, like magic points in later Final Fantasy games, you have a set number of spells, and you have to set them in your spell slots. You can only carry a certain number on each, at each level, and then um, as you level up, you get you could you're able to cast more of those spells before you rest. So, like in level one, um, eventually when you're like you know top max level, you can cast a ton of level one spells, and then some level two, some level three, but the highest level spell is level nine. 
when you're really high level, like you can, exactly, it's very similar. And so you can only cast a few level nine spells even when you're top level, um, which means that as you're going through a long dungeon and you're not able to rest regularly because you're in a long dungeon, you only have a certain number of places you can rest. Um, it makes it very challenging when you have wizards because you have to save their spells for when they really count. So I love that sort of that brings an extra level of strategy and difficulty. The other thing that I actually liked about Final yeah, Fantasy, I, I comment on that yeah. actually. That is the way it originally ran. Okay, mm-hmm. that's the way D and D was originally played. Nobody complained about oh, I got one spell. No, you figured out how yeah. to use it. No, no, I think it's great. Yeah. I think it's a great mechanic. And the other mechanic I liked from this one, um, which a lot, I'm sure, I'm sure it's something that actually they've gotten rid of in some of the later editions when they've re-released it. But I actually liked it. Um, essentially, you had to plan out in each um, random encounter, in any encounter, when you were fighting multiple enemies. You had to select which enemy you wanted to fight, and if and if that enemy died on your turn, you know it was turn based. So your team would go, then the, the enemy, the monster team would go. And if you chose to attack a monster that ends up dying from someone else's attack, well, well, your your guy would just basically lose his attack because he had chosen to attack a monster. In other words, you can't just in in modern JRPGs the way it normally works is you just if you want everyone to attack or cast a spell, you can just mash A because if if the enemy that they were cho- told to target dies in between the round, then they'll just move on and automatically attack someone else, usually at random. But in, in Final Fantasy I, you had to be tactical with it, and you had to say, okay, I think that this guy is going to hurt this monster for this much damage, therefore I'll have this guy attack this other monster because I, wanna, I don't want to waste that attack. Because the game was pretty hard, so if you wasted an attack, you wasted it around with, with you know, some of your characters, that could mean the difference between, between surviving that battle and dying. But at the same time, if you didn't double team certain monsters, if you didn't kill them on that first round, then you left them open to exactly. some nasty stuff. Exactly, back exactly. So it added this extra element of of strategy that later Final Fantasies lacked, which is why random battles became so boring in later in later um, editions of the series because you really could just mash A and it would just sort of like do it for you. You had to really plan things out. Um, maybe it's just because I'm an old fogey, but I actually really enjoyed that element of the series. Uh, but yeah, that's all I'm going to say. I actually, I, I've, I've enjoyed going back through it. I'm probably not going to end up going through the entire game. I've run through the entire game several times already. Um, I don't really have the time to go through it all the way again, but I did get pretty far. I got um, past that, um, oh geez, that first town where you fight through the pirates and you get the pirate ship. So it's about as far as I got. Might run a little further, but I'm probably not going to go through the game again. But I will say it is a game worth visiting, especially for someone that's a long-time JRPG fan. You want to kind of see one of the early ways the games used to be played. So I never had the NES, so I, 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 I never got to play that game. But it does sound exactly like D and D. It's very old school tactics, and yeah. if you're and if you're into that sort of thing, it's something that that is pretty fun to go back and look at. It's definitely inspired by tabletop. There are mobile ports if you want to try to play it that way. There are, but you have to be careful which one you find because some of them use that new mechanic where there's actually versions of it where they go back and they change the magic system to BMP and it, it breaks it. It makes wizards way too powerful. Because in that game, they were set up to be, um, you can only have a few spells, you had to be very careful. When they make it MP-based where you just have like a magic bar that you can spend, suddenly when you have a lot of like high-level spells, you can just spam them and it makes it easy. This is funny because so, this loops back into what I was talking about, the simulation of Stare of the exactly, 80s, yeah. where everybody looked back on Gary Gygax's design, which wasn't more than 10 years old at the time, and said, mm-hmm. oh, we can do better than that. That that makes no sense. Why can you get hit like by 15 crossbow bolts and still walk around? Because nobody bothered to read in the uh, DM guide that, you know, that's not representative of actual physical damage, right? Right. And so everybody comes up with these ways to do things better, and they never understood the Vancean system because most of them hadn't read Jack Vance. At all, or the modifications that Gary Gygax made to it. So I'm not, I'm not a Gary Gygax worshiper. Don't get me wrong, but those things had a purpose, and I think that if we don't go back and research these purposes, we end up making all these changes that are totally unnecessary and make the game unbalanced, like you said. Right. There was a reason the wizard had limited spell slots, and exactly what you said, it was to promote strategy. It was to promote a thinking man's approach to the dungeon. So. Yep, and I understood that even when I was eight years old. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. Alright, so I want to talk real fast about that very popular site, Good Old Games, GOG.com. Um, as you probably know, it is a fantastic repository for old games. But the coolest thing about it is that they're self-installing. And the nice thing about them is 
Um, you can pretty much play them um, on anything that you own uh, as long as you just reinstall it and you can save the file forever. Um, you hit with uh, some of the sales that come, like I, I bought every D&D game that ever existed for 35 bucks. Oh, you mean like the... the uh, gold box stuff? Yeah. Gold the, box games? Sort of all of it. Pool of Radiance, all that. Yeah, everything from the very beginning. Is that including like the Baldur's Gate? Yeah, and all yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, literally all of them. Those are pretty so, wide... Yeah, pretty yeah. wide sale. Um, but the cool thing is, I mean, it's like, uh, it's DMC free, mm-hmm. or a, a DRM free. Um, it, it's all that stuff. I mean, it, 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 you just, you have it. You own it. That kind of thing. So that's what I love about the site. Well, here's the new thing that they've done. Much like uh, Steam, if you will, they now have what they're calling GOG Galaxy, which... Uh, GOG re- Galaxy. Reading, Sorry, that, they needed a little bit they of They needed it. That was, that was good. Uh, <laughs> reading, reading from their website, it is a fully optional client to install, play, and update your games. It also offers online multiplayer, achievements, chat, game time tracking, and more. But it's up to you which features you want to use. Um, and it's in beta right now. So uh, they're in version 1.1. 1. 1. Uh, it's got like rollback and friend search and pausing downloads and things like that. Uh, so instead of just managing your files in your folder and installing them when you need them, now much more like Steam, they're trying to build a community type of thing. I think it's super fantastic and I'm really excited about where it's, it's it, headed. It's cool. making people interested in the history of games. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Well, I mean, and for a long time, um, when, I, when I taught games in game history... Uh, I would talk about Psychonauts, and my students would be like, "What? What? What's that? I don't know what that is." Because it, it hit that sort of um, sweet spot where we didn't have the game anymore, and it wasn't on a current console. Well, now with systems, well, I don't even know if it's a system, yeah, but but sites and services like GOG, you can go. Okay, listen, I want you to play Baldur's Gate. Go get it. It's like five bucks. Download it, play it, and we're going to talk about it in class. Um, and, Gog, and, and was Gog. able to do the same thing with Psychonauts. I remember when that one hit GOG, and I was so excited. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it wasn't long after that that it also hit some of the other consoles and things like that. But um, anyway, cool site, GOG.com. Check it out. Check out the Galaxy. I would actually like to add in, again, linking both of these two things with the things we previously mm-hmm. talked about. Uh, the computer game versions of D&D that you found were actually presaged by Gary Gygax. I've got this quote I wanted to read to you guys. It was from Dragon Magazine in 1979. And I find it, uh, and the reason I'm reading this to you is because I want you to know that this was always in the cards. This was the way it was going to be. He says, Dungeons and Dragons can be played on a computer. Computers are most certainly a big aspect of the near future, particularly the home computer. Non-programmable computer games are already making big inroads into the toy and hobby market. He goes on to say, they will grow still more, and soon programmable games will join this trend. D&D program cassettes plugged into a home computer would obviate the need for the DM or other players. Thus, the labor of setting up a campaign or the necessity of having a fairly large group to play in it would be removed. The graphic display would be exciting, and the computer would slave away doing all the record work and mechanics necessary to the game, giving nearly instantaneous results to the player or players. Computerization of D&D has many other benefits also, and such games would not destroy the human-run campaign, but supplement game participation. This is the direction we hope to take, make available to D&D. Let's see if my foresight is as keen as my hindsight. Gary Gygax, The Dragon Number 22, February 1979. So, a lot of these games that we talk about on here, the Pool of Radiance, all the way up to World of Warcraft... Uh, online, that these were these were all in the cards at the beginning. Gary Gygax foresaw this, and so when you're thinking about all the newfangled mechanics and why we used to do things, it always pays to go back and look at why the original designers designed things in the way they did, and why a game may or may not uh, work on a computer environment as well as it does at a tabletop environment. So I thought that would be interesting. I don't know if you guys that that might lead in a little bit to some of the stuff we're going to be talking about a bit about a bit later too. So, but that, that's a pretty interesting quote. I mean, it's it's always cool when you hear someone uh, sort of consider the where the future might take something that they've created, and mm-hmm. especially since he was so influential. Of I, course, I love that quote. RPGs. You were the first one to ever read that to me. And, um, I, I just I love it. I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're gonna go right on into our meaty topic for today. We're gonna talk more about interactive fiction. Chris, you want to start us up? Yes, yeah, actually, one. Um, thing I thought I'd mention because we got to a point uh, when we were talking a little bit about how um, we had different story structures and we had multilinear and things that are you know um, threaded and sort of bottlenecked but not necessarily branching and all this different stuff um, and the 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 topic came up of the cop outs I believe it was um, 
you know, the the game breaking thing you do at a certain point in uh, Morrowind, for example, that says, uh, okay, the story can't go on now, and it would take a lot more uh, processing power and writing and stuff like that to really have a game that reacted realistically to that instead of just saying, okay, game over, you broke it. And it reminded me a little bit of the um, sort of graduate thesis project that I did um, for my MFA, which was an adaptive narrative game is kind of the way I like to pitch it. And what I did is I had basically two acts, and it was a very short game. It's meant to be played in 15 to 20 minutes, but also highly replayable. Um, where in the first act, you're able to sort of go between these two towns and talk to a number of characters, and depending on what you say to them and depending on how you react to things, uh, it's tracking a bunch of different variables where basically what I was doing is guessing um, if the player responds in this way or they make this choice, they're interested in this sort of theme or in this style of playing. Uh, and then what I did is when I tracked those variables, and I also tracked a few other things like how familiar you were, familiar you were with different characters, um, I would change the storyline of Act 2 um, to suit their interests. Um, Computer adaptive role playing. Yeah. Uh, and so, for example, you know this character really well, and you're, the theme you're interested in is, I think the ones I had were like conflict, faith, and um, something else. I forget exactly. It might have been redemption or something like that. It was love. <laughs> it wasn't love. No? Uh, but love does play into some of them. Uh, but more like familial than <laughs> romantic. Undertale flashbacks. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but depending on the theme and depending on who you're familiar with, it will give you one of nine different storylines. And then you're able to make a few different choices. Actually, each of those storylines in the second half are a little bit more linear. It's more... I, I tried to make it in the way that it's going to make sense that you're sort of on a railroad here, um, or on a rail, because um, you've got this goal that you're trying to do. And if you, for whatever reason, decide not to do the thing, then basically you'll get a game over that says, well, you chose not to do the thing. Um, but it's a choice you made and not that you broke the game, per se. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that the ter term railroad, by the way, mm -hmm. is universally despised mm -hmm. at this point. If you ever say something's a railroad, it's a huge insult to whoever wrote it. Yeah, so. it's on a rail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree, it is an insult. Yeah, so It's an insult, I'm calling it. <laughs> I just linear, linear play, I guess, would be more... Uh, the correct term because railroading implies you're forcing somebody down a path. But what you're talking about is they choose the path mm -hmm. and then they go down the path. Mm -hmm. But so. it's it's fairly transparent though. They don't actually choose the path. It's, the path is chosen for them based on what they do in Act One. But they're still taking actions mm -hmm. that choose the yeah. path, regardless mm -hmm. of whether they not know the meta picture. Yeah. And they also get to choose how it ends. So the the ending half is chosen for them, but the decision they make at the end is also. Theirs. I know the back end well enough to say that it's a light procedurally generated story, mm -hmm. um, in the sense that it's reacting to well, what you've done, but. Um, continue. It's actually pretty simple. Um, <laughs> yeah, it really and, is. It, but it, it was also... Elegantly simple. Yeah. It was intended to be kind of a proof of concept of the idea of having what the player does um, affect the, the way the game plays out. In fact, uh, sort of my big picture, if I was ever like take this idea and make it much bigger, it was to make it so that the types of activities you do also determine the type of story you're interested in. If you're constantly going around slaying monsters then clearly the story you're interested in or the style of game you're more interested in is action-driven and sort of conquest and all this different stuff, and you can make that play into it. But if you spend more time as kind of a, a crafter or if you spend more time talking to people, then the story is going to tailor it to sort of suit your interest there. Um, but the other reason I bring this one up is because I was thinking an interesting solution to the Morrowind problem would have been that the game doesn't end when you do something game-breaking. It just removes your ability to finish the main quest. But there's still consequences for that. Uh, so basically, you yeah, I mentioned for those <laughs> that don't remember, we mentioned this Morrowind problem in the last um, the last podcast. We essentially talked about how whenever you were um, you had the opportunity to kill NPCs that were uh, crucial to the main quest, and it would give you this little pop up that would let you know that oh yeah, uh, because you killed this person, you've uh, irre irre irrevocably. Like, there you go. Mm. That's a hard word to pronounce. Irrevocably? Thank you very altered much. Altered the course of uh, But yeah, you've altered the course of, of the, the future of Morrowind or whatever. So essentially, you couldn't beat the game 
which was a huge cop out. Mm-hmm. But then you know well, you, you mentioned the other followed example of what's important is that you find this item. It doesn't matter how you find the item. Exactly. So it lets you. You really don't. You never yeah. run into that. Um, um, in fact, you can you can literally kill anything you want. You can go into a town, mm-hmm. and if you wanted to, you could spend the time trying to kill everyone in, the, in that town, including the guards. It might be difficult. You mm-hmm. might not survive. But if you do survive, you know it's an option. It's mm-hmm. something that. You have no reason to do. There's really not a benefit to doing it. Well, but see, now you really it. just pointed out the the reason that tabletop role playing games still exist, and the reason they won't be, won't be supplanted by video games anytime in the near future until we get holodecks or AI computers, because it is very hard to program that number of variables in to take yeah. into account all of those different possibilities. You're only a programmer; you can right. only go so far. And well, and, and as Konami right. says, you can only take well, so long. That's because what what Fallout did, which was interesting, with 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 um, Excuse me. What Black Isle did with uh, Fallout, um, the series, well, at least the first two, was they gave you kind of like the concept of the story. It, they gave you like the story hook, which was okay. You got to you have to go find this water ship, the Gecko water ship, to save your 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 vault from destruction. And then everything else in the game, all the little events that you that you encountered, all the little story things were completely optional. Everything was just go. Mm-hmm. If hy- hypothetically, if you've played the game before. And you and you already know where to go without doing any investigative work. You can immediately go find the watershed if yeah, you want. Yeah, but the drawback to that is what's still done today, which is that each city is its own silo, mm-hmm. um, and mm-hmm. and there might be some hooks that lead you to other cities and stuff. But um, or it's just open and saying I need a thing, and then there's lots of places where the thing is mm-hmm. available in the world. But mm-hmm. the design, you can clearly look at it and go, Ah, I get it. Team A built this city over mm-hmm. here, and Team B built this city over here, and, and and you can tell that the writing even within those is kind of inconsistent and and things like that. Right. Well, I mean, I'm not going to say it's a false game. I'm just saying that the fact that you had you the opportunity to um, experience all of these different stories, storylines, and events, and 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 ex- explore the world mm-hmm. at your own pace. Without necessarily having to worry about, oh, I just I just broke the game and now I can never finish. And it. I absolutely agree with you on that. And and don't get me wrong, I'm picking on one of my favorite series yeah. of all time. Um, but you know, Chris was talking just a second ago about the idea of the story changing, um, or or the 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 actual dialogue changing according to the decisions you've made. Mm-hmm. The special system had that built into it from the very very first. If you put a stat on your character who was so incredibly dumb that he was nonverbal, your yeah. your options became Came ug, um, uh, and er, and and people mm-hmm. look at you and go, uh, "You're clearly too stupid to be here." And Goodbye. They they actually brought that back for um, Fallout New Vegas yeah, because it was designed by the same team that did well, Fallout Earth Two. Earthheart was was involved in that one, yeah. Yes, yeah, so. and so and so it was um, Chris Fergus, uh, like Chris Avalon as well, and they were they were involved in Fallout. They made Fallout Two, and they were also involved in Fallout New Vegas. Um, and yeah, they brought back a lot of little things from mm-hmm. the original, but it's still. It still had limitations that were uh, introduced into the series with Fallout 3 that I'm hoping that Fallout 4 removes, but I seriously doubt it because Bethesda, uh, they they don't understand, they don't understand, in my opinion, they don't understand what they're doing when it comes to the way that they tell stories. The way to get around this is relatively simple, and that is, you guys are looking at this from a narrativist point of view, okay? And video games are not naturally narrativist in structure. They are games built for gamist people. They're ludic structures. They're ludic structures. Yeah, okay, I'll I'll buy that. Ludo-narrative, notwithstanding. So, in order to build a bigger plot structure into a game like that, you need to build a bigger plot structure out of a lot of smaller plot structures. So, naturally, you're going to have small missions, and then these should cascade into something larger. That way you can never kill the guy Mm -hmm. That gives you the mission, the big mission, right. because and, he doesn't technically yes. and exist. And that was, that was, I think, what they were going for with the original Fallout, was all these smaller missions that were technically leading you, helping you get clues and build up your your um, your team and all that kind of stuff so you could eventually find where the water ship I was. two did that better than and, one. And I, I, I agree with you. I think two did a little better better job with it. But neither, both of them were still flawed. And I do think that that, but, that concept is a great way to go with it. Yeah, and you can. And the the beauty of it is, is that the variables build up; they collect yeah. towards a point where it didn't matter if character two hundred and forty three never had the information to begin with, because if if the narrative structure builds up that way, then that becomes the gatekeeper, so mm-hmm. to speak. When they give you a mission, it's going to lead you in a direction. Nobody has to have the big picture. And all this sort of leads me into the the other solution I might have suggested, which in the case of Morrowind, even if you do the game-breaking thing, the game doesn't end necessarily because, one, you can put in ways where 
you're not going to be able to break the game. You think about that, and you find, like, you know, the item is still there. It exists. You can get it. Right. You just but may also, not. You, you may be eliminating um, one of the easier ways to get it, mm-hmm. or some of the information you might have a more difficult time mm-hmm. getting it. But, but also, you still have to deliver the information to lead you to the other thing you're fighting. In original RPGs... Yeah, well, sure, but but why should just one or two characters have that information? Well, why no, not litter multiple characters? Original them? RPGs were about exploration more than anything else. Right. They are about examining the... Uh, the environment, looking for things, finding clues and stuff like that. And I find that most of the modern games are much less geared towards that. It'll take Metal Gear Solid, for an example. you got these 20-minute cutscenes, and you've got very specific play leading you in very specific No, 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 but that's... No, but the mechanics, when you're actually playing the game, is the exact opposite. It's actually, you're in a you're in a big world, it's all free form, and you can approach it in any way you want. And you can you can either try to go stealthy into a place, you can go directly to the mission location... Or you can go around and try to gather information from all the different different little like villages and like outposts See of the what world. You did it's thing. actually no no but <laughs> I, I think, never no, no no but I think I think this is a good point to make because because Metal Gear actually does give you all these options. It does give you this large world where you can go around and explore. But it actually does a really good job with that. That's actually one of the things that a lot of the other, earlier incarnations in the series did not do. Yeah, you're talking about five specifically. I'm talking specifically about five. You could make that argument for, for the earlier Metal Gears, but five specifically doesn't do that. It actually lets you explore an open world. But that the point the is, is that exploration was the key 40 years ago. Yeah, and right. nowadays, everything was much more linear and story yeah. driven. And, and, and again, Metal Gear's not even a, an RPG, so it's maybe yeah. not the best comparison anyway. So coming back longwise to my but also. Um, but also you could have... Can I also point it out? <laughs> uh, but you can have also a way that you have basically a time limit installed. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have a world that you've thought out really well, but you only need so much content because you know after a certain point the game ends. So even if you do the game-breaking thing and you never find the item you need in the world, there's going to be a point at which you didn't focus on this. Cause it could mm-hmm. even be a matter of like you didn't focus on. This is something I really wish that when I played... Um, like The one Elder Scrolls game I've really played at length, and even then not as much as some people, was... Um, oh, what's it called? Oblivion, it Morrow, Skyrim, and Arena. Skyrim, yeah. Skyrim. It was Skyrim. Skyrim was five. Yeah, five. Oh. So I played a bit of Skyrim, and the thing that really bugged me is that there was no permanence to the world. And the fact that you could basically ignore the main quest, it's like the apocalypse is coming. It's yeah. kind of important that you address the apocalypse issue, but so... You're free to go off and not address the apocalypse, but after so many days in game, the apocalypse is going to hit. So if you haven't dealt with it by then, look, game over. It'd kind of be in a way like Majora's Mask, but on a larger scale. But that doesn't even happen in Skyrim. But I agree with you, that would be cool. That, that's, I, think, that's, I think a lot more games and, need that. And Doc, you can maybe back me up on this, but um, doesn't that in Fallout, technically, if you take too long to get the water chip, yeah. it'll actually give you a game over and it'll say, like, cause after like a certain number it's of days. Of days yeah. Yeah, yeah like, you're, well, it, it's. I, I think you have like a hundred days or something. To and, then, and you can actually days. extend that by buying water and sending it back um, yeah. from the water merchants. Yeah. But that's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. yeah, basically, what happens is you've got a certain number of days, or else everyone in your vault dies, mm-hmm. and it's game over. Mm-hmm. It it actually, it, in a lot of ways, was a game that was ahead of its time. That unfortunately. Um, other games, both RPGs and even the Fallout series after two, didn't really build on those elements because there were still a lot of flaws in in those two Fallout games. But at the same time, they introduced a lot of really cool things. Um, some of it borrowed from tabletop role playing, but it's a lot of interesting ideas that were not really followed up on. Um, and you know, a lot of people, I guess, maybe because it was too hard to do and it, you know took too much work, or because the focus shifted over into cutscenes and voice acting and that kind of thing and they just didn't have the budget to do that right they didn't have the budget to do that with and also have all this content so maybe that's part of it too but uh but yeah i mean i think it's, it's something to go back and it's worth exploring it's one of those retro games that's worth going back and playing and you can maybe learn a little something and possibly that can impact your if you're say an indie game designer that can possibly impact what you're making it will definitely change the way that you present your game material to people and how they take it in the visual game is a lot different from the oral game, as I've always said. Two entirely different sections of the brain they create and two entirely different uh, experiences for the gamer. So creating thinking puzzles and thinking games is is going to have a lot longer lasting uh, impression on the people you design for than just giving them visual spectacle, which is basically Mm -hmm. a movie with short interactive elements. I agree. The thing that I remember a lot from, for example, one of my favorite series, uh, The Legend of Zelda, is... Um, trying to find dungeon entrances and then also exploring the dungeons and trying to solve the puzzles within the dungeons. So, I mean, there was, that was a big part of the Legend of Zelda series and it's a lot more memorable 
than just like you know some artwork in the game. Those of you who have played tabletop RPGs know the difference of how you can throw a hook out there, but your players just totally ignore it. <laughs> And off in an entirely different direction. Especially if you played with some of the groups I played with who, who delight in saying, oh, you want us to go where? Yeah, we're going to go over here and burn this village down. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's something that makes role-playing unique. But, you know, you can do that in video games. You can you can create the uh, the openness and still have the hooks. The, the fallout, when you were talking about, is a hook, right? Yes, exactly. And it has consequences that will eventually, but it doesn't stop people from going and doing what they want to do. Right. And I think that's the best. That's the best compromise right there. Totally, yeah. in every way, shape, or form. That takes it back to its roots when the games were about exploration and about you know finding out things about the world. That was the fun, right? It wasn't necessarily about the character and, and making him a god, but about you know just finding out more about the world in general. I want to do a shout out to Way of the Samurai. You know this game? Yes, I, I do. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I do. You know what's significant about it in terms of what we're talking about? Um, it also kind of did this, you know, procedural story concept. If it's the game, I'm, it's the game I'm thinking. Well, of. It, it was more reactionary wasn't it, than the procedural. Wasn't it a Sid Meier? A Sid Meier game? Um, or am I thinking of I a different? No, one? this is a, this is a PlayStation Two release. Oh, I'm thinking of a completely different Samurai yeah, game that no. was like very story driven. You have to build like your your um, um, your your daimo or something like that. Like your all of your different troops and it was actually from let's see spike bam oh. and idos oh, okay and, sorry and carry on the game i'm thinking of came from like 1989 or something so, yeah so. no this was a 2002 <laughs> it's something release. samurai back um, when we played oregon trail we got dysentery and we liked it <laughs> <laughs> now in uh in japan it was just called samurai mm. um so but but basically um you're it, it, the whole thing takes place in one village and there have been lots of sequels, and, and, the, and the key mechanic sticks around. Um, but basically, time progresses, and, and it's kind of in real time. Um, and things happen. And so you can go and talk to a person or not talk to a person, and whether you've talked to them or not talked to them changes the story. Um, and, and, and significantly changes the story, too. It's not like a false uh, choice, that sort of a thing. Mm-hmm. But if I recall correctly, and I'm not getting my games mixed up, um, I think at the end of it, whenever you get your ending, what it shows is sort of... Um, uh, this kind of monochrome samurai sword, and the thing that you revealed, the piece that you revealed, lights up and becomes full color, mm-hmm. and it shows you how much you missed. Mm-hmm. And you can go back and replay, and within the meta knowledge of that other playthrough, you can pick up other pieces of the sword. Mm-hmm. And so you, you're, you're kind of playing more than a hundred percent. You're playing like six hundred percent in mm-hmm. the sense that you want to get all the different clues and all the different pieces, so that you, the player, in the end, can finally figure out what happened that day and all the things that happened, and maybe even get the best ending. Mm-hmm. That is a perfect example of the Greek god human pawn thing, where yeah. that back back when we used to play role playing games, we didn't really think of our characters as ourselves so much as we thought of ourselves as kind of like creating the story by putting these characters in interesting situations, right? Mm -hmm. And it's sort of that kind of thing. You've got the overview of it. I wonder what would happen if, you know, I made him go delve into that cave or whatever or jump down that hole or climb that mountain. Which is why you don't worry about killing off our characters, you son of a... <laughs> sorry, sorry. Exactly right. A little, little bit of yeah. I like. PTSD I don't want my there. character to die. All right, that's an extension of me. <laughs> it's, it's a very different thing. And, but and I have exo memories of me dying. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's exo role- memories. He's using Sarah's term. Good. I like that. It's called role playing. I'm role playing. Come on now. Sorry, uh, I'm rolling in my grave playing. Yeah, really. Speaking of the differences <laughs> in between that kind of stuff, I mean, one of the one of the things y'all been talking about interactive text adventures, that kind of thing. I started playing those when uh, Infocom was still around. We were playing Zork and, and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and stuff like that. And it kind of emphasizes how fun a game can be without those, all those visuals and cutscenes oh, and things yeah. like that. Um, they can be damn frustrating at times. Oh, I remember the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I got <laughs> stuck on this one thing. I was Arthur Dent. I got beamed up to the Vogan ship, okay, just before Earth gets destroyed, and I'm sitting there, and it tells me uh, it's pitch black. You can't see anything. You can't see it, hear anything. You can't taste anything. You can't feel anything. And, you know, I'm just playing with this thing over and over. What the hell am I supposed to be doing? Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're supposed to smell something because it's they're waving smelling right. salts under your nose. And it was little puzzles like that that would drive you insane, but also kept you just, you know, kept you, kept you at it. Kept yeah, and as out. I recall, there's you're like low sodium or something, so you have to eat some saltine crackers that happen to be in your... Uh, 
like compartment or whatever. I mean, it's it's crazy stuff. To get the babel fish out of the tank yes. was a there it was a like a five step process yes. because every time you punch the button, the babel fish would shoot out the chute and go sliding into this hole That's in the right. wall. And uh, you know, to be fair though, Douglas Adams really really wanted. Uh, text-based adventures to work in a way that they couldn't work. That, that, that we just weren't able to make them. Work. We still can't make them work. Yeah. And some of his essays on that stuff is really, really cool. I, I recommend Salmon of Doubt. Um, it's both extremely frustrating because it's an unfinished work and extremely satisfying because it's a collection of his essays. Yeah. Um, there's a treatise in there on uh, the uh, the idea of being a uh, evangelical atheist that I think is just <laughs> fantastic. It's just this brilliant thing, um, you know. And here I am. Oh, I'm, he doing, was... I'm doing a Bible degree, but yeah. uh, you know, this guy he 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 was an amazing writer and wrote so many things. And one of the he was early really big buddies with uh, Richard Dawkins. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 he was. Um, but one of the, the the early essays that he wrote that I absolutely loved was talking about a mobile device which had like two hours worth of battery life. Um, but the, there was a little keyboard uh, attached to the thing. He couldn't figure out how to use it. So he was talking about using just his thumbs and that you can reprogram your brain to type with just your thumbs. We all do this. Yeah. <laughs> but, but he wrote an essay about discovering that in his bathtub. And you can imagine this six foot three man feet sticking out the end of his bathtub as he's playing with a mobile uh, device. I'd rather game. not, but... <laughs> uh, well, you know, I'd never not imagine a six-foot man uh, lying want, in a bathtub playing with his mobile device. If you want to imagine it... Um, Especially before there were smartphones. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> imagine it correctly. What you can do is get the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy miniseries. He makes a cameo as the go. man who walks into the into ocean the light, naked. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> Throws his money in the air. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so there were there were certain people that believed it was a bad idea to come out of the trees. And yeah. Some people said we should have never gone out <laughs> of the trees. Yeah, Stay right. in the ocean. So that's Douglas Adams' <laughs> actual butt, um, if it helps with your imagery. It does. Yes. It does. Thank yeah, you. Okay, no Thank problem. He's looking at his digital watch. Where were we? The, really... the point was, is Starship that... Titanic was going somewhere with that. I don't know. But... Well, that was his, that was his eventual swan song, as far as being. Uh, yeah, it was awful. It was absolutely terrible. But the, the the point was is that the games required a lot more vivid imagination. I'm not even talking Atari imagination. I'm talking about you really had to play that in a different mind space. Yes, you did. Than the visual uh, games that we play yeah. today. There were no cutscenes. It was you wandering around exploring a world and basically in the background building up variables that helped you do other things. I picked up this thing. I yeah. talked to this person. Yeah. I visited this room. That sort of thing. And while they were much more primitive. Um, I think in a lot of the ways they, they, they tell an interactive story a lot better than, than a lot of the modern games. Well, they're there. telling the player's story in, in many ways. If, if you compare, say, let's just jump to adventure games, uh, which has a very strong connection for just a second, and compare the original Monkey's Island with that, you know, pick that moment that you were like, I figured it out after yeah. eight hours of trying to solve one thing. Yeah. And compare it to Tales of Monkey Island, which is a more recent entry from, what, four or five years back, where if you were stuck, you had to hit the triangle button and bring up the clues, and you bring up enough clues, and it basically solves it for you, and it tells you. And, and if you don't want to do any of that, you can just get on the internet and do it. And Yeah, we didn't have internet, man. We I, didn't got, have I it. was stuck for days on that stupid Babel fish thing. Oh, yeah. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Well, um, we're probably going to have to again put another pin in this topic because we've been we this topic ended up being less about interactive fiction and more about interactive storytelling. So just interactive narrative and, and the way the game, the different ways that games tell stories, um, both tabletop games and video games. Well, I think there's, um, it's a, an, but it's a great topic, and I yeah. think it's something we should return to. Did you do you have any closing thoughts for us? Well, I think there's a natural evolution here. I think we've come full circle. All right, mm-hmm. we started off with Infocom. We've gone to this highly visual, linear, narrative storytelling thing. And then now we're getting back to what, you know, really Infocom could have been mm-hmm. if they had had better graphics back then, which is this really nice art, like Darker Dungeons, or not Darker Dungeons, what's it called? Dark Dungeons? Darkest Dungeons. Darkest Dungeons. Let's see, there's a role play. Oh, game yeah, yeah, Darkest, yeah. Darkest yeah. Dungeons. Yeah. Which is, like there's a picture, like in a book, and then there's text that tells you what's going on, and there's a little more variety in the combat and stuff mm-hmm. like that. I've got actually got Steve Jackson's Sorcery on my mobile phone, mm-hmm. all four parts of that. Um, and I think we can evolve from that, and this is what I'd like to talk to you guys next time about, evolve from that to actual audio drama interactive where it is still all in your brain there's no visual element to it but it's all acted out sound effects it's like taking the shadow and you're the shadow and you can make the decisions for the shadow 
So you can use his powers where they need to be, so on and so forth. And that's something that I was working on at one point. But I think that is a natural evolution of the text-based game and a much better game for the busy gamer who doesn't have time to sit down in front of a visual medium and pluck at buttons. I think we so. can all definitely relate to yeah. that. <laughs> so very, very quickly, let's all just describe our perfect interactive fiction moment, um, what we think it would be. Maybe it's a real one, maybe it's not. Interactive fiction or just interactive well, narrative? Well, interactive narrative, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Nathaniel, I think you just did yours. Yeah. An interactive radio drama. I yeah. think... I, I think, love classic age of Honestly, for me, I really do think that the cl- that the closest has come, like the, the couple early Fallout games where... Um, and Planescape Tournament arguably did a lot of this too, where you have a, you have a story hook, and then you're able to experience all of these different different storylines or not. You can approach it in any way you want to. Um, and as long as eventually you find a way to satisfy whatever your main goal is, um, everything else is, just happens organically throughout, throughout the game. So for me, it's something like that, of a heavy focus on exploration. Like you're saying, very similar to tabletop games where the focus is very much on exploration. Exploring the world, exploring everything like that, as opposed to just your character being some sort of like, you know, chosen one god kind of thing. They mm-hmm. actually make fun mm-hmm. of the concept of the chosen one in Fallout, the first two, yeah, multiple times. Um, You're more Mad Max. You just keep wandering into these situations, yes. going, "What the hell have yes. I got myself into?" Which <laughs> is quite a bit of a contrast from Fallout Three, when arguably you are the chosen one. So it's like it's very much, yeah. yeah. That's true. Uh, anyway, that, but that would be my answer. I think I don't think it's perfect, but I do think that it's that it's close. Um, the, the, the ideal would be those little stories that you had between the, the different towns and, and in between those towns were, would have, could have, of course, been a lot higher quality, could have been better done. Um, you could have had multiple ways to approach them as opposed to, you know, really they were just, you can either solve this quest or not, that kind of thing. But so more options than what they had, maybe expand on that concept of the hook with multiple hooks and multiple smaller hooks and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Cascading. Um, yes, like you, yeah. were, like you were talking about earlier, yeah. Uh, Chris? So it's a hypothetical game that's kind of a blend of a couple of things. I love, love, love Mass Effect style, Telltale game style, branching dialogues and decision making. Unfortunately, they don't branch quite the way that you would like. It, it, it feels really cool the first time through, but of course you figure out that it's all bottlenecked and mm-hmm. it's basically and, linear. And what I want is the game that gives you that experience, mm-hmm. but has the sort of consequential, like, I can make a decision here in episode one that takes me down path one of 72, you know, just throw out a random number, Mm -hmm. that by the end of episode five, I had a totally different gameplay experience than someone who made, you know, choice B on that A, B in episode one. That sort of thing. It's just something that is so incredibly expensive to try to do that I know it's probably not going to happen in, <laughs> in well, my again, lifetime. But cascading, yes. cascading mm-hmm. ga- game design is the way you do that. Mm-hmm. The, the slow buildup of variables in the background. There may be a variable that means nothing to paths 1 through 10 sure. that sends you off in an entirely mm-hmm. different direction. And there are, li- there are a lot of ways I think we can simulate to get closer to that. But basically what I want is a way that you can have the sort of flexibility of a tabletop role-playing game that you happen to experience through a video game. I think you just described the reason why I've never been able to finish a Mass Effect game. It's because you go to these side planets, and what you do there just doesn't matter. You're just grinding. The grind. I I, I mean, I've never, I've honestly never finished a Mass Effect game either, and probably for the same reason, even though I've played um, all three of them, I've gotten pretty far, and I've like watched some videos for some of them. But admittedly, yeah. I've never. I desperately it wanted to carry over a shepherd into another mm-hmm. game, and I wasn't able to. Mm-hmm. I just uh-huh. couldn't do it. But in that same hypothetical game, I also want it to be the Elder Scrolls Skyrim, where a dragon comes and attacks the village, and the village is burned down permanently. Yeah, but that doesn't happen in Elder Scrolls. It doesn't. But I want to. Oh, you want it to? Okay. Yes. <laughs> you, don't, you don't. You don't want like children dancing in the, in the flames from the dragons and like and then, and not ta- even taunting caring. you as yeah. they don't die in the. Flames. That was one of the yeah. brilliant things about thing we should... random encounters, and, the, and and they were never handled well in the in the computer games of the late eighties and mid nineties. But random encounters were meant to spur. A whole new story. If you're level one and you see a dragon flying over your head, you don't fight the dragon because there was no balance back then. It was, there it is. What are you going to do with it? No, you run and hide under a rock. Mm-hmm. But in your mind, you're like, that dragon went flying off. I bet there's a dragon's lair over there sometime. One day I'm going to be a big bad mofo. I'm going to go over and kick his butt and take his stuff. Right? Right. And so it was constantly generating. That's the procedural generation of RPGs that uh, I have not seen replicated in, in in computer RPGs mm-hmm. anywhere. So, mm-hmm. well, well, Doc, do you want to close us out with your yeah? Perfect? You know, yeah. um, honestly, the closest that it's come in a long, long time for me was Lifeline. Um, just trying that a couple of weeks ago, and that 
real time element of it, Gen- genuinely sitting around and going, oh, come on, message me, come on, come on, message me. Um, when it's not even it's not even a game that needs to be online. I mean, <laughs> it's it's literally just on your phone. It's on a timer. Um, that that element of feeling like it was interacting. I haven't felt that kind of um, genuine adrenaline rush since I um, puppet mastered Dave City mm. back in the day, many many years ago. So um, it mainly inspired me to like want to build on their concepts. It was kind of like a cool yeah. idea, but I had a lot of issues with it. Yeah. Well, and, and I that's agree another, with that. I, that's another podcast. I played, I agree with that. I played yeah. Lifeline too, even, mm-hmm. and in many ways, it's a superior game. It's got a lot more content. I I didn't really like the ending. Mm-hmm. Um, I enjoyed the character. I enjoyed other things. Um, but you know when I went and replayed both of those then because I loved them so much I realized how linear they truly mm-hmm. were and how much false choice was really there and all mm-hmm. that but that didn't change the fact that when I played it the first time with that first lifeline man I was on the edge of my seat the whole time it was fantastic it was can, brilliant can you believe that they even have that option where you can turn off the real time um, well I, I failed can, once in order to yeah. do it though you have to fail. That's true. And actually, I never failed in the first one. I got at the end of the game, so well, I assume I it was the end of the game. Yeah, I yeah. pushed in too hard and killed him. So. Uh, oh, I, I had a wrong Oh, my arm. goodness. You killed him. I did. It was a TPK. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I want to compare that to something like uh, uh, Time Crest by Sneaky Crap. Um, you know, they've got a really great idea because they've got time travel involved and that kind of a thing. And you have special knowledge. And it explains how he's communicating to you on this stuff. And it just, the writing just kind of fell flat um, Mm. for me. So honestly, uh, I think one of the things about Lifeline that was so very, very good of it was um, the writer. It was pretty well written. I think he was just really, really good. And that real time, that real, that faux real time to it that I think, I agree with you. I think that was one of the most appealing things. The writing was very strong. I've been on the search. So, um, you know, if, if anybody out there has a really great one that they just think that we should play, um, for a future uh, roundtable or something, shoot it to us. You know, put it in the comments because I want to know. I've downloaded a lot of stuff recently, and it just hasn't really held up. You know, Too much stuff Noble Circle, one. Ratline. I tried some of the Voltage Entertainment stuff, which is surprisingly dirty. Um, it just that just it just doesn't doesn't fit. Didn't work yet. But I hope 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 that this resurgence in IF uh, is going to be. Over the next 10 years or so, something really cool. Because you've got small dev teams, you've got a portable device. The potential is there. It's huge. Um, But yeah, thanks for coming out. And we'll invite you back and we can explore some of these other topics that we didn't quite get to because, you know, we talked about so so many other things. But um, I hope you all enjoyed the show. Uh, So I'm Jim and I'm going to sign off. I'm Doc. I'm Chris. I'm Nathaniel. All right. Thanks for listening. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us what your ideal interactive narrative would look like, assuming it doesn't already exist. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.